And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. It was an ordinary day, just like hundreds of ordinary days before it. As sunlight filtered into the sparsely furnished room, this old man pulled aside the blanket and slowly rose from his bed. Walking stiffly to the wash basin, he washed away the slumber from the night before. Looking at his reflection in a small mirror through eyes clouded by cataracts, he carefully combed the thinning hair on his head and the full beard on his face. His normal routine of a light breakfast would have to wait as he seemed compelled by some internal force to leave immediately so that he might attend to some undisclosed, urgent business that was only a vague impression. Hurrying as quickly as age would allow along a path he had taken hundreds, perhaps even thousands of times, he soon arrived at the entrance to the temple. No matter how many times he had stood in this spot, the magnificent splendor of this house and all it represented never failed to cause him to pause and bow in humble, reverent worship. Even at this early hour, the place was already teeming with activity, and the old man positioned himself against the wall so as not to obstruct the flow of traffic. His senses were assaulted with the sights, Sounds and smells of animals being slaughtered and placed on the altar for sacrifice. Prayers were being offered. Incense was rising. Everything seemed very ordinary, just like every other day in all the years the old man had been coming. Thinking he must have somehow misunderstood the prompting in his spirit, and hearing his stomach growl in protest of the missed breakfast, the old man turned to go. Just then, his attention was captured by a young family entering the courtyard. To the casual observer, there appeared to be nothing unusual about them. Older man, younger woman, carrying an infant. Obviously, a young family coming to observe the ceremonies that had been prescribed in the law for the birth of a child. They would have already observed the first ceremony on the eighth day after the birth. In that ceremony, the son would be circumcised and through this practice would be identified as part of the covenant God had made with his chosen people. And this is when the child would have been officially named as well. Following the birth, the mother, according to the law, was considered ceremonially unclean. In the case of the birth of a son, she was required to be in something like quarantine for another 33 days. Then she would go to the temple, and there ceremonies would be observed in fulfillment of the requirements of the law for her purification and the redemption of the firstborn. The law called for the sacrifice of a lamb and a turtle dove, along with five shekels as the price for redemption. If you couldn't afford a lamb, two turtle doves could be brought instead. The offering of two turtle doves reveals the limited means of this couple so intent on observing the customs for the mother and her six-week-old son. 
The old man had witnessed this scene countless times in his years of coming to the temple. But while everything looked routine on the outside, there seemed to be something different about this family. The quiet grace and gentle humility of the couple caused something to stir in his spirit. As he watched, he heard the words of a promise issued many years before resonating in his spirit. A promise that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Finding himself irresistibly drawn to this young family, a question began to form in his mind. At long last, is this the one? Slowly, hesitantly, he approached the couple. As he reached out and gently took the child in his arms, assurance flooded his heart. He lifted his eyes and began to sing. He sang of a promise fulfilled. He sang of future possibilities for the people of Israel that would extend to a promise of possibilities for the whole world. He sang of a savior for all humanity. He sang of personal contentment, contentment in a promise fulfilled that would now allow him to die in peace. Standing in the temple, holding that child in his arms, all the waiting, the longing, the expecting, the hope, all the trusting and the believing in the promise of God given to him so many years before, all of it came together. It was worth all the years of waiting just for this moment. And Simeon lifted his voice and sang. The name Simeon means God has heard. Now think about that. For hundreds of years, through untold pain and suffering, Israel had been crying out for divine intervention. And now, here stands a man in the house of the Lord whose very name is a proclamation of promise. Simeon, God has heard. At the end of the Old Testament, the prophet proclaimed in Malachi 4, 2, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. With the words of that promise, the curtain drops. At the end of Malachi, the voice of the prophet is silenced, and Israel spends the next 400 years without a fresh revelation from God. Caught in the middle of political intrigue and military conquest as Syria and Egypt fight for supremacy over the known world. Through 400 years of silence, Israel was crying out, longing for a savior. Longing for redemption from the tyranny of her oppressors. Longing for restoration of peace and security. And just when it seemed like they were completely abandoned, along comes Simeon, whose name is an affirmation of hope. God has heard. (laughs) Even though the Romans are currently in power, it's okay. Hold on to the promise. God has has heard. Even though the people of God are oppressed, don't despair, God has heard. Even though you haven't heard another sound from heaven for 400 years, don't lose heart, God has heard. Even though you can't see anything happening, never fear, God has heard. And here we are in this worship service on the Sunday after Christmas already turning our attention to the new year that is right around the corner. Christmas Day has come and gone, and some of you are still looking for the fulfillment of God's promise to your life. Some of you are still looking for redemption from pain and fear and bondage. and Some of you are still looking for restoration of peace and joy and contentment. Some of you are at a point where <laughs> nothing's really changed, And you've decided the promise of God is no longer valid. Some of you may have abandoned all hope. Some of you have concluded that God has forgotten about his word to you. But I came to this pulpit today to remind somebody, God has heard. 
Hold on to the promise. It's too soon to give up on the dream. Don't short circuit the possibilities. God has heard. He heard you crying at the midnight hour. He heard you at the bedside of your loved one. He heard you when you were all alone in that dark room. He heard you when nobody else knew anything about your heartbreak. And I'm here to tell you, he hasn't forsaken you. He hasn't forgotten his promise to you. Hold on to that promise. God has heard. Now, the the story of Simeon illustrates some of the qualities that are necessary in order for you to step over into the new possibilities God has for you in this coming year. These are qualities that need to be cultivated while you're waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise. I want to know, is anybody still waiting on God to fulfill what he said he was going to do in your life? Anybody still have any promises? I'm just making sure I'm preaching to the right crowd today. Okay. First of all, if you're going to receive this, there's something you have to do, and it's the quality of preparation. Verse 25 says that Simeon was righteous and devout. Simeon had a personal walk with God, a personal relationship with him. This also tells me that he lived a life of integrity. Now think about it. Here was a man who waited years for the fulfillment of God's promise. But while he was waiting... He was preparing himself for the day when God's promise would come to him. While he was waiting, he walked with God. While he was waiting, he maintained a life of integrity. See, Simeon obviously was known by those who ministered in the temple because of his frequent attendance there. They were used to seeing this old guy come in for worship. Just because he had received a promise didn't mean he just sat in his recliner at home and watched game shows all day, waiting for God to drop the promise in on him. Just because God had revealed a possibility to him didn't mean he just kind of coasted along. Patience, you see, isn't really a passive thing. Patience means that you aren't trying in your own strength to make something happen. Instead, it means that while you're waiting on God to do his part, you're busy wrapping your life around God. You're drawing near to him. You're making yourself available to be used by him for divine purposes. You're honing your skills and you're developing your abilities. You're doing what you need to do to be able to handle the blessing when it comes. It is this active patience that positions you to then be able to step over with confidence into the possibilities God has for your life in this coming year. It's what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount when he said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, understand, when I talk about the promise of God, I'm not talking about something you conjured up out of a colorful imagination. I'm not talking about wishful thinking. I'm I'm not talking about something you kind of talked yourself into because it's always been your heart's desire. I'm talking about a specific word from the Lord that is a promise for your life. If you have been given a promise by God, know that there are some things only He can do, and then there are some things He expects you to do. You cannot do his part. He will not do your part. See, we get all confused about this stuff. Too many times we're trying to do God's part, and God says, you can't mess with that. You're just going to have to leave that part alone. You just do your part. And then sometimes we don't fulfill our obligations to do it. But it's a cooperative effort. It's a partnership. His part is to maneuver all the pieces around to bring about the fulfillment at precisely the right time. And can I just insert here, his time is never going to be your time. Your time was yesterday, or preferably the day before. Come on, somebody, am I, you know? And God says, no, it's going to be the fullness of time, and only he knows what that is. So his part is to maneuver all these pieces and to get them all in the right spot at just the right time. Your part 
is to make sure that you've done the preparation required so that you can handle the possibility when it arrives. Now, let me illustrate it this way. See, it wouldn't do some of you any good if God fulfilled a promise to bless you financially. It wouldn't help you a bit because you haven't spent the time to learn how to manage those resources when God brings them to you. That's why we have, that's why we have people that win the lottery and a few years later, they're declaring bankruptcy. They don't know how to handle it. Why would God give you better when you're not taking care of what you have? Why would God give you more when you haven't learned to be a good steward of what you have? Okay, let me bring it down to where we live. If you won't tithe on $10, why would God bless you with $100? I know you thought you were just coming the Sunday after Christmas and just get this little, this little nice pick-me-up. You didn't expect the pastor to start slapping you around, okay. But I'm already this deep into it. Let me just go on a little bit, all right? Because I just got a don't care spirit that came on me, just, you know. It wouldn't do some of you any good if God fulfilled a promise to bless your relationship because you haven't made an investment to learn how to have a healthy relationship. You haven't dealt with your personal issues. So all of that excess baggage you have, it keeps sabotaging any opportunity for a meaningful connection with someone. You got to deal, deal with your stuff. You're going to love this one since we just came out of the holidays, you know. It wouldn't do some of you any good if God fulfilled a promise to bless your health. Because you haven't disciplined yourself to be able to maintain the physical benefits God brings to your life. You know what we do? We eat all the wrong stuff and drink all the wrong stuff and we don't exercise like we know we're supposed to. And we, we heap all this stress into our lives and we don't deal with all of that. And as a result, what does it do? It affects us physically. Some of us, we'd get a, oh, help me, Jesus. Ah, some of us wouldn't, would, we could take, we could stop taking most of the medication that's in our, in our shelves if we would just take better care of our bodies that God has given to us. Pastor, that is so good, man. I didn't expect you were going to get many amens when you preached it, but you're a true prophet. Here's what we do. We eat ourselves and, and refuse to discipline ourselves sick, and then we come forward and ask the church to pray for healing. And sometimes God graciously heals us. But if we don't change our ways, six weeks, six months later, we're going to be back down in the front wanting to be anointed and prayed for one more time for healing. We, we have to do our part. Do, 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 you, do you understand? We have a part in this. God says, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll bless you. I'll help you. I'll give you the ability to do some things. But you know, God gave you a brain. Some of you will be glad to know that. And he expects you to use it. Pay attention. If you know this is bad for you, don't eat it. I, many years ago when my, when my grandmother and my dad, for that matter, when they were both still alive, Granny was visiting with us. And one night, you know, we're, we're, we were raised in the South. Everything was fried. You know, we fried everything. And so one night, Dad had, Dad had fried some pork chops. They were on the table for dinner. And my grandmother, she's in her 90s at this point. And she got one of those pork chops, and she was like, Oh, son, this is so good. This is one of the best pork chops I've had. In all, oh, this, and she just went on and on. The next thing you know, she's reaching over to get an, another helping. 
And my dad looked at her and said, Mama, you know those pork chops are not going to be good for you. You know that if you eat too much of this, you're going to wake up in the middle of the night and you're going to be hurting. She said, but they taste so good. He said, Mama, you know not to do that. She said, but they are so good. I'm just going to, you know, it'll be all right. He said, all right. He said, go ahead. You are 90, however many she was at that point. She was in her mid-90s. And he said, you can eat whatever you want to eat. But in the middle of the night, when you wake up hurting, don't call me to pray for you. I'm not going to pray for you. (laughs) My dad, pastor for 40-something years, I'm not going to pray for you. Sure enough, she ate the pork chop. They went to bed. About 2 o'clock in the morning, she's in the bedroom groaning, oh, oh, and she's calling out, Johnny, Johnny, I'm I'm hurting, pray for me. He said, I told you I wasn't going to pray for you, go back to sleep. And he rolled over and wouldn't pray for her. I wonder why, you know, I wonder if sometimes the Lord doesn't say, I told you that was bad for you. You know? Some of you have been praying for the right opportunity. But what are you doing to prepare yourself to take advantage of it when the Lord brings it across your path? When God makes a promise, then it's up to you to do the necessary preparation so that you're ready to walk through the door when he opens it. You can't open the door, but you can be ready to walk through when he opens it. His promise is fulfilled and the possibilities come to those who are prepared. Well, there's a second quality that needs to be cultivated. It's the quality of position. Verse 25 of our text says that Simeon was looking for the consolation of Israel. Verse 27 says that he came in the spirit into the temple. Or came, yeah, came in the spirit into the temple. See, here is a man who isn't swayed by the outward appearance. He wasn't moved by the negative report. He continued in a spirit of expectation and he put himself in a position to be able to embrace the possibility when it was revealed. Because that promise was from God, Simeon put himself in a position to be where God was. God was in the temple. The promise was from God. Therefore, Simeon was in the temple looking for God's promise. I'm amazed at the people who are looking for the blessing and the help of the Lord, but they want to stay away from the house of the Lord. If you want the blessing of the Lord, then you need to position yourself in the place where the Lord is blessing. If you want to find the Lord, the first place you need to look is in his house. In some 38 years of being a lead pastor, I suppose I've heard most of the excuses people use for not being in the house of the Lord. I've heard there are hypocrites and gossips in the house of the Lord. I've heard there are people who judge you in the house of the Lord. I've heard the music is too loud in the house of the Lord. I've heard the temperature is never comfortable in the house of the Lord. I've heard the preacher is too loud and too long in the house of the Lord. Hmm. Didn't think much of that one, but uh, uh, listen, I won't argue with you that if you look hard enough, you'll find people who are hypocrites and gossips and judgmental and mean-spirited and critics and cynics and impossible to please. You'll find all of that in the house of the Lord. You will. It's called being people. But let me tell you what I find when I come to the house of the Lord. There's a whole lot of love in the house of the Lord. There's grace in the house of the Lord. There's healing in the house of the Lord. There's deliverance in the house of the Lord. There's freedom in the house of the Lord. I found there's forgiveness in the house of the Lord. 
And there's caring and sharing in the house of the Lord. And, and there's help in the house of the Lord. And there's hope in the house of the Lord. And there's joy in the house of the Lord. And there's peace in the house of the Lord. And there's restoration in the house of the Lord. And there's redemption in the house of the Lord. And there's wholeness in the house of the Lord. And there's comfort in the house of the Lord. And there's strength in the house of the Lord. And there's mercy in the house of the Lord. Those are the things I find when I come to the house of the Lord. And if any of those sound up appealing. If any of those things are what you need, then you need to position yourself in the house of the Lord. This is where the blessing of the Lord flows to his people. Simeon kept going to the temple because he wanted to be in a position to receive the promise of God when it was fulfilled. He acted like every time he went, that would be the day when he would see the Lord's Christ. I want to know something. If you have a promise from God that hasn't yet been fulfilled, how are you acting? Are you acting like the promise is sure and certain because God said it? Are you acting like there's a possibility on the horizon just waiting to be embraced? Or are you acting like your situation is hopeless? Are you acting like every time you walk in the doors of the house of the Lord, that just might be the time when heaven opens and God comes through for you? Or are you staying away from the house of the Lord because you've been disappointed so many times and you're afraid of being let down once again? I want to suggest to you somebody needs to start acting like the promise of God is true. You just need to start behaving like, like the promise is real. Somebody needs to start acting like Philippians 4.19 is true. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Somebody needs to start acting like Psalm 27.1 is true. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Somebody needs to start acting like Hebrews 13, 5, and 6 is true. He has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? Somebody needs to start acting like Romans 8, 37 is true. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Somebody needs to start acting like 1 Corinthians 15, 57 is true true but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ somebody needs to start acting like Psalm 23 and 6 is true surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever God has promised he has heard your cry so start acting like his promise is true. Live in faith and hope. Live in expectation. Live like you expect just any minute to turn the corner and walk right into the new possibility God has promised. Now there's the quality of preparation. There's the quality of position. Finally, I want you to see there's the quality of perception that needs to be cultivated. Verse 25 says that the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. Verse 27 says that Simeon came in the Spirit into the temple on that particular day. Uh, no doubt there were hundreds of people milling around the temple when Mary and Joseph came with the child Jesus to observe the rituals and ceremonies required by the law. The priests who received the sacrificial offerings saw them. The, there were others waiting their turn to offer their own sacrifices that saw them. Rich and poor, young and old, people from every station of life saw this young family. But of the perhaps hundreds of people who saw them that day, only Simeon understood what he was seeing. Only Simeon had perception. Everyone else saw with natural eyes. Simeon saw with eyes of the Spirit. See, others saw a baby. Simeon saw the Christ. Others saw an ordinary newborn. Simeon saw the Son of God. Others saw a routine religious exercise. Simeon saw divine possibilities. 
Simeon saw a savior. Simeon saw a deliverer. Simeon saw hope personified. Verse 32 says that Simeon saw a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And what I want you to know today is that if you're going to embrace the divine possibilities God has for your life, then you're going to have to have spiritual perception. Because the opportunities that God brings will probably not come the way you expect them to come. You can't dictate how and when and where God will open a door. It's going to be according to His timetable. It's going to come where He wills. It's going to come in the manner He decides. But if you don't have spiritual perception, you're going to miss it. We sang a moment ago, you are great. You do miracles so great, but we miss the miracle because we don't have spiritual perception to discern what God is doing. I want to tell you, in the process of God bringing his possibilities to you, he's going to lead you by some strange paths. He's going to put you in places that are going to be uncomfortable. He's going to stretch you. He's going to challenge your long-held ideas and your cherished traditions. And if you're not in tune with the Spirit, if you don't have spiritual perception, you'll miss what God is doing, and you'll miss your miracle moment. Notice this. When the Spirit spoke to Simeon and told him to go to the temple on that day, notice Simeon didn't argue. He didn't say, Lord, you know, this is just a waste of time. After all, I was just there yesterday. He didn't say, Lord, you know, my age has got me down. I I just really don't feel up to it today. He didn't say, Lord, you know, I, I have relatives in from out of town, so couldn't we just make it next week? No, no. The Spirit spoke. Simeon obeyed. The Spirit called. Simeon said yes. Preparation, position, perception. This is what will enable you to reap the reward of new possibilities for your life in this coming year. Now, before I conclude the message, there's one other thing I want you to see in this song of Simeon. In verse 29, he's received the child, and he lifts his eyes, and he begins his song with the words, Now, Lord. When Simeon embraced the new possibility wrapped up in the Christ child, he said, Now, Lord. When Simeon embraced the one who had not only promised, but would now finally bring redemption and restoration, he said, Now, Lord. And it's entirely possible that I may be talking to somebody today who has heard the word of the Lord about promises and new possibilities for your life. Promises and possibilities for redemption and restoration. Promises and possibilities for new opportunities and new ventures. Promises and possibilities for prayers answered and dreams fulfilled and hopes realized. And maybe you've heard messages like this before, but but today something just feels different about it. Because today faith, has begun to rise in your heart in a fresh new way. A faith to believe like like you've never believed before. A faith to embrace the exciting things God has in store for you in the coming year in a way you've never embraced them before. Faith to pursue God and devote yourself to His kingdom. A faith to not be swayed by what it looks like on the outside. A, A faith to surrender to the leading of the Spirit and to acknowledge Him in all your ways. If that's you, if if that is beginning to resonate in your heart, then this becomes for you a now, Lord, moment. It's what Hebrews 11 and 1 is talking about when it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The moment you fully embrace it, it's yours. The moment you receive it, it's yours. Now, now, it may take a while to manifest. It may take some time to get here. But when the promise of God is made, when it is made, 
and a new possibility is embraced and faith rises in your heart, that becomes a now Lord moment. Have any of you ever had a, a large check written to you and you took it to the bank to make a deposit and the teller received it, entered all the information in and then just as you're ready to walk away said, now there's going to be a hold on this money for however long, a couple of days, a week, whatever, depending on the amount in the bank. Anybody ever had that happen to you? Yeah. I've had that happen. I've had that where I had a bill that was looming, and I wasn't sure how I was going to pay it. And I was worried and anxious and fretting about that, about getting that taken care of. And then I got the resources in, took that check to the bank, made the deposit, and then had them say, there's going to be a hold on this. But you know what? The moment I had the check in hand, I found the anxiety level about the bill going way down. I took it to the bank and handed it to the teller. Handed me the deposit slip, the, the, the receipt of the deposit. <sighs> Mr. Morgan, is, there's going to be a, a hold on this. Well, I didn't like it too much, but I wasn't worried. I wasn't worried. Why? A couple, several reasons. One, I had faith in the one who wrote me the check in the first place that they had the resources to cover it. I'd made the deposit. It was, it was in my possession. It's now in my account. I'm not going to worry about this bill right now because the resources are there. It's just going to take a little bit of time for all the pieces to come together to take care of that. Oh, is anybody hearing what I'm talking about right now? Do you have confidence in the one who has made the promise to you? When he makes the promise, it's yours. It's a now, Lord, moment. So you just let all the stress and the worry and the anxiety and the fear, you just let all of that go. You don't worry about that anymore because God has said it. It's a now, Lord, moment. I want to tell you, you'll act for the rest of your life like you already have it when you have a now, Lord, moment. <laughs> you'll never again be the same when you have a now, Lord, moment. I just wonder, I just wonder if there's anybody who's ready to embrace the promise of God for a new possibility for your life in this coming year. Anybody that says, I believe that's for me today, Pastor. Can I just see your hand? I'm, I'm ready to embrace that for my life. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to depend on God for that. Anybody ready to start acting like it's already yours? Now, Lord. Now, Lord. Now, Lord. The promise is given. The possibility is presented. Faith increases. Assurance comes. And from this time forward, I want to tell you, you're not going to be like you used to be. Instead, you're going to be like you're going to be. Because <laughs> this is your now, Lord, time. God is speaking to somebody in this service right now, saying, it's yours. Now, Lord. You have it. Bow with me, please. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the fact that your spirit um, impacts us with the truth of your word. Your spirit brings it to, to light and makes it an assurance. And so now, Lord, I pray for this congregation. I pray for these people who are agreeing with me. I pray for open doors. I pray, O oh Lord, for fresh vision. I pray for new resolve. I pray for new possibilities. And I pray for divine favor 
in their lives. Make it real to us in this moment that will forever change us so we will not act like we used to, but we'll be like we're going to be when that is completed in our lives. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will establish that truth in such a fashion that we will never again doubt it. And it'll change our behavior from this point forward. Do it, Jesus, I pray. Make this a now, Lord, moment in the lives of your people, I ask.